fun part, just waiting for it to start. Hello, welcome to today's live featured discussion about storytelling. I am your host, Curtis Anderson. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Now, for those of you who have been watching our live discussions every week, you may notice that this one is a little bit different than the ones that we normally do. Um, I have brought a series of professionals in the industry to be able to talk about storytelling today. And, uh, and if you caught my live video on Facebook just before we started, you may have heard me talking about how telling stories right now is so important. And so what we're going to talk about today is what drove us to tell stories, how we go about finding and creating those stories, and then what we do to be able to get over the challenges that are inherent with trying to come up and write and develop and do storytelling. Um, so let's introduce our, uh, <laughs> our panel here real quick. Um, Jeff, since you are a returning panelist, <laughs> why don't you get us started? Hey, I'm Jeff Garvin, uh, erstwhile actor, musician, now novelist. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Erin, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I am a director, writer, actor, uh, doing mostly comedy and genre blending with comedy, and uh, former trampoline director. There you go. That's actually pretty good. That's strong. I remember that. And Zeke, buddy, tell everybody who you are, what you do, and all those good things. Hi, I'm Zeke. Uh, I created Fun Size Horror um, and one of the co-founders of the company Fun Size Horror. We're uh, a platform, um, uh, a, a, a portal for short form horror content. Uh, and uh, on the filmmaking side of things, we really strive to put, uh, make things much easier for filmmakers to, to try to make shorts for us. Now, Zeke, that's all well and good, but I think we're all interested in who your little friend is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Skelly! <laughs> I'm, I'm the face of fun size whore. Kids, don't do drugs. All right, so. <laughs> I also like that it sounds like fun size whore. That sounds like a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fun size skeleton. <laughs> Curtis, I'd, I'd like not to be on panels with people who are funnier than I am anymore. It's... Je but Jeff, you normally do panels with me, so haven't we been defeating that the whole time? Well, that's a matter of opinion. I think Zeke nice. Skeleton is objectively funnier, and so is Aaron. Uh, so far, so good. All right. Now, before we get too far off topic... You might say we can talk about the bare bones of filmmaking. Oh, this is going to be trouble today. This is going to be trouble. The highlight reel is going to be like 15 minutes, and it's going to be like six hours of Skelly. All right. My mom is watching, guys. <laughs> Hi, mom. It's a family show. She it's a family show. that college tuition to have gone to something good. It did. It went to Skelly it jokes. Did. It went it to, did. yes. It did. Hi, Aaron's mom. I know. I'm not going to. I heard that. that there's a lot of boating on the internet, so I thought I'd fit in here. Oh, uh, yes. OK, OK. Before we get way too far off topic, just to start off real quick, all of us got drawn into this business in one way or another. Um, what drew you to storytelling, and, and how did you get started? Uh, ladies first, Erin. Oh, I was looking for a lady. Uh, so storytelling in general, I think um, I remember being a kid, uh, as I think we all were at some point. And um, my neighbors had a stage in their basement growing up. And so uh, my sister and I would always go over to their place and we'd put on these plays and shows. And I started, <laughs> I literally started like one man banding from like that moment where I was like, all right, let me direct you guys. And then come up with a concept and then like be in it as well. And, and I charge admission for people to come see, like I charge our parents admission to come see the show. Uh, so that was like the early days of being a multi hyphenate. <laughs> uh, and nothing's kind of really changed from that point. Um, but yeah, no, I got, I uh, went to school. I went to, I did a lot of plays growing up in like, uh, at high school, I went to a, a, a high school that had a, a dance program and a strong musical theater program. And I was just really mediocre at both of those. Um, so I was uh, really a strong ensemble team player for a while and then kind of more of the same in college. And then 
uh, started segueing from acting into into writing and directing um, really over the last few years in, in L.A. And it's been a lot of fun. Very nice. Was that? I don't even remember what the question was. How I got into storytelling? It's true, but that is exactly oh. what you answered. <laughs> and, you um, and actually, Aaron, one of the things that I really appreciate that we're going to talk about deeper later is the fact yes. that even as a child, you understood that you should probably monetize your work. Yes. And we're going yes. to get into that a little bit deeper. <laughs> uh, Mr. Garvin, uh, I, having known you for so long, I almost feel like it's cheating having you on the panel. I feel like I could almost tell your story. Um, probably okay. more entertaining if you told it that way, too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think I'd probably have too much hyperbole in my version. But um, what drew you to storytelling? And, and, and uh, you've actually crossed this gamut of yeah. different styles of storytelling. So how did you land where you ended up now? Well, my answer is, is one part uh, idealism and one part realism or practicality. I, I think, to be honest, at a very early age, I just enjoyed attention. And so everything became a microphone, the end of a jump rope, a rake handle. Um, and then I discovered that I could, you know, goof off in the school play and get laughs. And it was all over at that point. So for me, it was all, it started, to, it started off uh, being about acting and singing where I could get that immediate feedback. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I had a decent career as a guest star actor in my late teens to late 20s, you know, for about, uh, <laughs> that was a 15-year decade for me. Uh, and, then, and then when I quit acting, the band became my passion. And that was really where I started to tell stories. Um, you know, I, I went to Chapman University and got a degree in filmmaking. And so writing and directing was my first formal training. Um, so that plus songwriting was my real, really where I started to, to grind my um, nose on the grindstone of learning how to deliver a story. And then, you know, the, at some point, the band just became incompatible with the life that I wanted to have, you know, uh, being on the road for months at a time did not work. And so I had to reinvent myself and I needed to do something creative that I could do on my own with very little equipment at home. And I started writing novels. So that's kind of, that was the ramp into where I am now. And then five years after I made that decision, I published my first novel, Symptoms of Being Human, which is available wherever fine books are sold. And, and, and there will be a link to that in the description because promotion, sir. Mr. Panero, welcome back from Disneyland. I, uh, yes. I hope you had a good time yesterday. It was, it was fun. Please tell us um, a little bit about uh, your journey into storytelling. Uh, so yeah, I started storytelling by driving my friends crazy when they would play Star Wars characters or G.I. Joe. And um, they would be like, all right, let's just make them battle. And I'm like, no, we have to dramatically build up to it. Uh, and so I'd have, we'd have stories and stuff that like we'd have to tell. I would, I would set up scenes and everything through that and then uh that eventually evolved into my birthday parties where um i would write a script my birthday parties like from age 10 on became like me writing a script and then friends coming over and my mom renting a giant vhs cam recorder from the local video store uh hashtag i'm old and <laughs> um and then we would make a movie for my birthday and then i would watch the movie and be like this looks terrible what went wrong and then try to like reverse engineer um, why it looked terrible and nothing like the movies that uh, I was seeing on the screen. Um, spoiler, I'm still doing that. And uh, yeah, and then so then I've been out in LA for a while, um, you know, uh, came out here wanting to write and direct, uh, fell into a lot of editing and fell into a lot of frustration uh, as people want to do out here. And, uh, and then it just kind of got to a point where I realized uh, both not only me, uh, but uh, most people that I surrounded myself with um, were all very frustrated because they wanted to tell stories uh, and nobody was really giving them that yes uh, because everybody, you know, it, it's kind of a general misconception among many people that, you know, you, you need somebody to, uh, of, of wealth or means to give you a yes or some sort of, be on some sort of echelon above you to, um, give you permission to tell stories and uh and i realized i had a very i had a large network of very talented people that were in the same boat as me uh so i figured 
why don't we just all get together with a purpose? Uh, and that purpose was, uh, let's make five minute uh, horror shorts in time for Halloween. The goal is to make 31. Um, and uh, let's all help each other. Let's help each other as best we can because we're all very busy. And um, we formed kind of this really awesome collective. Uh, Aaron made a really awesome short for us. Curtis, you made some really awesome shorts for us. Jeff, you did nothing for us. I'm not talking <laughs> um, And, uh, and um, yeah, so then that wound up like we kind of maintained that spirit of let's help filmmakers, film, of filmmakers helping filmmakers making films, where um, it doesn't really matter if you have, you know, a hundred bucks or a couple thousand dollars, uh, you'll be treated equally um, and we'll help you as best we can to make what you can and uh, we'll help out. And, um, you know, we, we did the 31 and then we did another group, the 15, uh, we did another uh, 15 the next year and then we launched funsizewar.com where uh, now our shorts, we're not only posting our own original shorts, we're hosting user submitted shorts and then we also have uh, companies like Alamo Drafthouse who play our films before horror, uh, feature horror film releases. And um, I'm very excited because we recently extended that from not only having them show uh, our original shorts, but we're also um, uh, the filmmakers that are submitting shorts to us. Uh, if we really like it and it fits with a feature that's coming out, we'll submit user generated stuff so that those filmmakers are now getting national exposure as their shorts are playing before um, core features on every Alamo screen. Uh, so yeah. Um, that's that's how I'm where I'm at now. That's how I met my best friend Skelly, <laughs> and uh, um, there's your there's your answer. Stop. Thank you. Stop. Thank okay. you. Yes, that's good. That's good. Um, uh, you know that that community fi filmmaking aspect. That's something that I still very strongly believe in, and uh, and I'm really glad that, that has continued, because it it waiting for permission from somebody else is. Well, that's a whole different conversation. Um, but what actually drew you to filmmaking, like visual storytelling as the way that you wanted to tell stories? Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you mean by that, Zeke? Could you please elaborate on your stupidity? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I think it was, you know, it's, it's, it's hashtag again, I'm old. Um, being a child of the 80s, you kind of grew up I grew up around all these making of specials, making of Star Wars, making of Indiana Jones. And I think that was the first, like that era with like HBO and PBS and everything. It was the first era where like uh, a generation was really exposed to filmmaking on a massive level. Um, it wasn't just this kind of weird alchemy that, you know, you'd go see a movie and you, you wouldn't really realize making that movie. Um, and so I thought, you know, that, that's what I was just kind of naturally drawn to. Um, Have you tried uh, other styles before? Have you done like short story writing or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I did, I did some short story writing. Um, uh, I'm too lazy, so prose is just too much work. So I'm like, I'll just write one <laughs> sentence and then I'll worry about a DP making that look like something. See, now that's um, funny because I think screenplay writing is, uh, a, it takes a lot of discipline. I don't think you can be lazy and be a screenwriter. Well, this is why I haven't gone anywhere in my screenwriting career. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Well, Jeff, I uh, actually feel like, I feel like you've kind of uh, uh, it's described how you got to where you're currently at, but there are so many different types of novel writing that, that can be done. You started with Symptoms of Being Human, which is a, uh, a young adult style novel, but um, like... What is what is writing for you? Is it just anything that ends up between a pair of covers, or is there a particular kind of storytelling that you like to do, or genre that you like to work in? Well, in all fairness, I didn't start with Symptoms. Symptoms was the third manuscript that I ever completed. No, the fourth. It was the fourth manuscript that I wrote. So I have three unpublished novels before that. Um, one was like a romance horror. Um, one was uh, an epic fantasy, and then the other was a, I guess, more of a dark future, like dystopian YA. Um, 
so you know what attracts me I, to be honest there's something satisfying about telling a story that's totally generated from you with, with you don't have to write to a budget like you do when you're writing a movie anything you can imagine can land on the page um, but I'm old enough and I've done enough to know that I'm only at the beginning so I don't know that I've found my niche um, I don't know that I've found my niche or that I will find a niche. I think I'm going to write out a bunch of different things over the course of my life. I, one thing I know about myself is I, I, I don't enjoy staying in one place or, uh, creatively for very long. I like to change and tweak and modify. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that I found a way to make a living doing creative work. And so I do have a sense of duty to keep writing novels since that's where the opportunity is. Um, but I don't know that I'll write the same kind of novel uh, over and over again. I don't know that I'll stick to novels after I've got um, other things going. I, I can see myself making movies. Um, I'm working on a podcast. I'm in a band. You know, there's a, so cr creativity to me is, yes, novel writing is, is a great revenue stream and it's very satisfying in and of itself. But I always have to have other, other, every other burner going. I have to pass it around, you know, just like, you might find that you have, like Zeke said, he's got editing is where the opportunity was. Um, but he still has to keep fostering these other parts of his creativity. Excellent. And then, Aaron, I primarily know you from uh, your web series, Once Upon an Anonymous. Yes. And, and, um, and I know you from the rock opera that you did with that and Game of Thrones, the musical. And so, <laughs> like, my, my primary involve like, uh, dealings with you have always been either stage or web. Um, what drew mm -hmm. you to that style of storytelling? Uh, <laughs> it was cheap, I guess, like cheaper to do that. Uh, uh, well, the web actually got started uh, and kind of much like what Jeff was saying, the, the web series that people do know me from is probably about like my fourth one. Um, it's just sort of the one that popped uh, uh, it started as a parody video because I don't know if people out there know the show Once Upon a Time, but I used to, when that show first real, came real out. Real quick, before you do that, Once yeah. Upon a Time is a television show, a series on ABC. It follows yes. the, the tales of all of the fairy tale characters that you remember from Disney films and fiction that, that's available you know, without copyright. And uh, they are combined together in a single town where all of a sudden they live normal lives. But wait, it's because of a curse. Wait. That's yes. right. So there we go. Yes. And then there is enter straight woman. And she, uh, she sort of finds herself in this fairy tale land. Uh, and it's played by Jennifer Morrison. She plays this character named Emma Swan. Uh, we have the same initials. And we were born the same year. And we have the same face. So uh, <laughs> when the show came out, <laughs> True. Um, I had a lot of people. I'm glad she face. let you use the face for today's right? panel. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's like an Aria situation. We have, we have one Skelly like, already. Yes. <laughs> um, and so when the show came out, I had a lot of people asking if I had booked the show on ABC. And um, I love fairy tales. I always, I always have growing up. And so I checked out the show and, and I loved it. And then um, it started to get a little funky. Uh, like the first season and second season were a little uh, uneven. And so I was taking a break from writing. I'm, I'm one of those people too that I, likes to do a lot of different different things and I'll write multiple projects at once. And so I took a break from writing to write and wrote this sketch, threw it up, shot it for like 200 bucks in one night. There was like a helicopter chase happening while we were filming. So we had to pause like <laughs> two hours for that. Um, we got it up, we threw it up and um, ended up, it became a hit and um, uh, we ended up doing a follow-up entire season of a, of a web series. And then as a filmmaker, I wanted to grow and do different things. So I thought, why not do a musical film? Um, <laughs> and I always loved like Rocky Horror and Hedwig and those kinds of experiences, those cult films where, um, you know, there's music involved. And, um, and I have a background in experiential marketing. So uh, yeah, so I made this film. I ended up writing the music for it. And about that time is when I started doing Fun Size Horror, which where I met uh, lovely Zeke here. Yes. <laughs> and honestly, those two projects, doing Fun Size and doing the parody video, have brought everything else into my life. Um, everything can kind of be traced back to those, those two specific things. Um, so I kind of had this really interesting 
fan base of like some horror people in the horror community was expanding because my husband's in that business and a lot of our friends are. And then, uh, and then this sort of parody Disney world. Uh, and so now I've been sort of crossing them over and I was asked to do Game of Thrones musical, which is a stage show. Uh, I wrote the music for that and uh, I produced it and I ended up playing Cersei, uh, which has been a lot of fun. <laughs> By the way, for those By who the may way, be this is the Cersei seeing, ring. There it is. There it is. <laughs> That's Cersei ring. Official yes. costume piece from the show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, I should well, the official costume piece is massive, but it's the same guy who did it, and so he he, he gave me a uh, a one that I could wear on the daily, but I did get to see completely what I meant. Exactly yes, what she said. Yes, 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 yes. But um but the the piece is is there and available for for my use. Uh <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I ended up entering this world of music writing, which has been fantastic. And some from there, I ended up partnering, and and I just uh, just um, sold a screenplay that's a comedy um, that's in development right now. We're we're attaching our cast, and um, and then I'm in negotiations on a TV series. It's also like a fantasy comedy musical horror situation. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. Okay. Again, what was the question? No, no, no. We got it. I get we all got it. Rants. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just stop me. Here's just here's stop. the nice thing, Aaron. If if trouble cups up, then I just turn off your mic. So it's fine. Wonderful. We're doing fine. Perfect. Everything, Perfect. We're on topic. We're good. I, if you have the Cersei ring, just like drink wine with it, uh, with like yes. a, a self satisfied look, and then we'll all just be terrified. Little. <laughs> we're probably gonna die. Exactly. Yeah. I will say. I will say. This year, I've played like a ton of villains. Like I, I started last year with this film that I shot in NorCal, and uh, like each character I played this year has become like progressively more and more evil. Um, and it's really helped, like being in this industry, being like, you know, getting a little bit more aggressive with some of my gigs and meeting people. Like I've been like, all right. Like it's helped me to kind of own it in a way so I, I think i'm also just going mentally very unstable uh so who knows good to I know have to share, i have to share that all this talk of horror is nothing because i'm sitting in a cafe and umbop by hansen is playing <laughs> right now i don't know if you can hear it i, oh I can't God. and i think that's good that i can't because that way we won't get a copyright strike which is definitely something I want to avoid. So yeah, there should be like a violent montage to that song in some film. <laughs> yeah, like a, like they should recut the like the, the yes. Godfather. Yes. Actually, I don't want to get too far off that. Um, so, one of the things that I've noticed in all of the conversation that we've had thus far is that none of us are are single trick ponies when it comes to this kind of thing. Everybody has a variety of different things that they're involved in or that they do that is all focused on getting stories out. Um, what is the process that you use to be able to get these stories out of your head and onto paper or film or video or whatever? Like what, how does that, how does that happen? By any means necessary. <laughs> yeah, but but like I wish I, I wish that, but like, I wish there were I wish there were a consistent tool. But it's more yeah. like it's more like you have a toolbox and you're you know, it's like you have drills and hammers and you know, pickaxes and you approach the mountain and whatever the, that mountain is, and you have to figure out what it's made of and figure out what you get to use. So you know, if I'm gonna be like totally day to day specific about it. You know, ideas arise. That's how neurology works. Um, but they tend to arise when you have a, a, pr a disciplined practice of making time to allow them to arise. So I sit down at my, you know, I drop my kids off at school. I sit down at my desk and I face a blank page, whether there are any ideas or not. Usually there aren't and I procrastinate. And then later when I'm trying to drive my children to school and they're arguing in the back seat, I have an idea and I'm recording a voice memo while I'm driving or I'm at the gym or whatever. And then so I vomit them in whatever way I can. I record them as voice memos on my phone. I have Evernote synced between all my devices. Um, and pieces fall and you start to put them together like a puzzle. And at some point you, you, you have enough of a puzzle to start filling in the blanks. That's, that's how stories happen for me. It usually happens around a character. Um, and I just take notes and little blurbs and little pieces bubble up to the surface. And then at some point, it's impossible for me to stop, to not sit down and write chapter one and start composing 
and just, you know, it's an act of faith. You just start writing and hope that the words keep coming. I get that. I get that. I appreciate that answer, but I don't think I was specific in what I was hoping to get. So let me ask the question better, but I'll let Aaron go first. Well, I, I have a specific, like a very specific tool that I use, uh, if that's helpful. Um, so please, please don't say drugs. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I totally agree. I think, I think we do look for like, what is that answer? What is that button? And I don't think it's one specific thing. Um, but I will say when I am switching, especially back into writing, into the writing phase, um, I will say that the thing that as somebody that is also very easily distracted and, and lazy and unfocused at times, uh, what helps me is to put like my timer on my iPhone for 15 minutes. And a lot of times that's all I have. Um, and I just look at the, that blank page and I say, I set the timer 15 and I'm like, you know what, whatever I can get done in 15 minutes is good enough. And there's no judgment about how much or how little is on the page. If it makes sense to the script, if it makes sense to the story, I don't care. It's just more about like getting into the habit of writing again. And almost always I want to go past the 15 minutes. Um, but I used to teach like a class on called 60 day screenplay. And um, this is how I wrote my first screenplay. And this is how, I taught people how to write their first screenplays and um, and it got done 15 minutes a day, 60 days in a row, somehow create something. <laughs> um, so that's how I sort of hop back into writing and really get more on a, a routine with it. And like, like uh, Jeff said, um, the ideas never come when I'm like sitting in front of my computer. So I personally love to take like just really long walks midday. And that is almost always when any kind of writer's block I have or any idea or any, any like situation where there's like, Oh, I don't know what to do. Like for some reason taking that, the solution just always appears um, or the creative idea always appears. So those two things are probably the most, I would say like the most effective tools that I've used. That's really more where I'm trying to go with this. Because like, <laughs> there's, there's, there's process and then there's, and then there's, what do I pragmatically do to be able to yeah. do something? I know that I do a lot of my best work, whether it's preparing for a role or whether it's developing a story idea or even just uh, in, in the most like uh, non-professional way, just, just like preparing a role-playing character or something like that, mm -hmm. that like journaling will help guide my, my brain in the direction that I want to go where I can just jot down ideas and maybe just string a couple things together in a couple sentences um, just yeah. to kind of put myself in that place. Uh, Zeke, do you have a, a, a practice or a process or, or things that, that are consistent in the work that you do to get to where you're at? I can only speak to all the things I've done wrong. Uh, Actually, that's, that's, even, that's as important so as yeah. anything that happens right. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think uh, journaling, as you said, is, is a really great idea because that's something that I've, I've recently, like, discovered. Uh, not recently, but it's one of those things where, like, I don't, I, I always kind of fight myself on doing when you really should uh, kind of embrace it because, you know, you, you get an idea that you're excited about. You want to, like, jump right into the writing process and writing the script. And then you start writing act one and you just like hammer it out and you're like, oh, this is great. And then you get an act two and you're like, oh, God, this sucks. And then you get excited about another idea. So then you, you know, throw that away. And like the best thing to do is, is for me is to not start as, as, as impermanent as script writing is because you just delete it or whatever. There's, you kind of get the psychology in your head. At least I do. You get a psychology in your head. It's like, oh, it's now in, you know, final draft or Scrivener or whatever you're using. So this is it, this is the script. And the best thing to do is to, you know, get a notebook and know all the beats of your story and your character before you really, and, and just let yourself just kind of rewrite and see, you know, it's, 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 it's like, you know, uh, 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 what is what's it's like when you're panning for gold, you know, and you just kind of keep, you know, throwing stuff into the thing and sifting it out and seeing what good ideas are there and figuring out kind of like what your story is. Um, before jumping into the writing process. Because once you start kind of jumping into the writing process and you don't have, a, 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 all the details of the map don't need to be there, but you do need to have a, a clear road of where you're going. 
um, that uh, you, you you need to kind of have all of that done before you can really jump into to to actually telling your story. You need to kind of you know, like I said, you need to know your characters. You need to know um, uh, where your story is starting and where it's going. Uh, and once you kind of can get that out onto a script, uh, once you kind of have, have done all that work in a journal and you kind of get that out of the script, then you can get to the process of fine tuning. And it's knowing that it's knowing that no matter where you are in the process, you can always go back and fix it, but you need to get to the end first before you go back. Uh, because if you start fixing things in the middle of the process, you're going to lose your way to getting to your destination. I agree with you on that. And I think it's one of the reasons why you and I work together so well is because we both <laughs> believe in the vomit pass. Yes. Where <laughs> it's just, it's just get it all down, get it all down. We'll fix it in post. And by and post, I, get, I mean the second draft. I get a, uh, I have a writing partner, uh, Skelly. And what do you do, Skelly? <laughs> what do you do, Skelly, when I'm not doing my job? I come in and I say, hey, I got a bone to pick with you. You got to get your nose to the grindstone, pal, because I don't have a nose. And one of us has to do that. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Um, <laughs> you have um, uh, something that I, you've talked about before in our creativity discussions and, and some of our other talks is an invocation that you do that you, you took from the War of Art, or at least the idea from the mm -hmm. War of Art. And um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about that and, and what it does for you before you begin your, your actual work. You know, it's interesting. I haven't been using that lately. Uh, oh. I should re Well, let's talk it. about that, actually, because maybe, maybe you've just outgrown it, or is that part of the process you don't do anymore? So, you know, there's this, there's this conversation about creativity being uh, a state of mind or, or being in the zone. Um, and I think the, <laughs> once kids came into the picture and my life got to get more, a bit more complicated, I, I sort of surrendered to the idea that my creative mind is always there and it's always working and it's available to me whenever. Um, and so, for a long time, I had a I had an incantation that I said, and it was some pieces of things stolen from uh, or borrowed from uh, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, um, uh, and stuff that I wrote myself. But essentially, it was a it was a it was an intention of I'm going to sit down and create, and it doesn't matter what comes out, and it's and you know the like, like kind of like she said, no judgment, you know whatever happens in this time is fine. And, and that I, and that my intention is to fill a blank page and nothing more. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of divorcing yourself from expectations, yeah. detaching yourself from, uh, from outcome, you know, in the, in the Buddhist way. Um, but th you know, the more complicated life gets, the more I realize that who I am is a creative person and that create creativity is how I approach everything. And when I'm not approaching something from a creative standpoint, that's when I'm really not being myself. And so I'm trying now just to be in the stream of life. And when that stream of life takes me in front of my keyboard, I express myself there. And when I'm driving my minivan with my kids in the back, I try to express it there. Um, so I think the older I get, the less I'm trying to compartmentalize. This is my work time. This is my lifetime. This is my creative time. And I just have to roll because you never know when something is going to sideline your day. And I get very angry and hostile when my creative time is interrupted. And it happens so often now that I just don't have the luxury of being angry that much. It's just miserable. So I just have to kind of roll with the punches. Um, so I think maybe that's part of it. Maybe I should go back to doing it. I don't know. Hey, um, try it, and the next time we chat, maybe you can let us know if it's if it's helped you at all, or if it's, yeah. if it's gotten bad. I guess I guess what what I'm trying to say is there's this, I think, pernicious myth out there that creativity has to be a special sacred time, and you have to light candles and darken the room, and it just it's not true. You can do it. My friend Jeff Zentner, who's written two really popular books, won, won the Morris Award uh, for um, the Serpent King. He wrote his books on his phone, on the train, on the way to work. 
Like you just don't have to have a special sacred space. You can create anywhere, anytime. And in, in the gig environment that we're in, in the gig economy, you kind of have to be a mercenary about it and do, do it wherever you can and whenever you can. Actually, Jeff, you touch on something really important because one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation at all is because this series of discussions, my Actor 101 series, all of these things are designed to help people who want to do more creatively realize that it's not outside of the realm of possibility for them to be able to do it. And so um, uh, when it comes to the types of stories that we all like to share, what kind of, what do you need to tell that story? I know as an actor, I don't need much. And, and, and part of the reason why we came up here to Portland is so that I could take advantage of not needing much. Now, mm. I do happen to have a camera. That's, that's a part of what I want because I want to be able to broadcast. I do want to be able to distribute to as many people as possible, even without like Paramount doing it for me. So a camera is important for me, but you can do that now with these, you know, eye gadget things. Um, uh, I've got a computer to be able to edit it together, to be able to do that kind of stuff. But even if I was completely out of cash and I could not afford internet or the power to be able to charge up the batteries, I know that I could go to Pioneer Square Park and I could do my one-man version of, of uh, the YouTube's comment section if I really wanted to. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, like like as a so performer, <laughs> right? By the way, uh, my one-man show, the YouTube comment section will be going up in December, 2017. Um, but, uh, but I know that, that as, as an actor primarily, I need my body and whatever that body can do mm -hmm. to be able to perform. What are the things that you guys need? And, and I'm going to be a little specific, Aaron, I'd really like to know what it takes for you to be able to put up the web series, Jeff, what it takes for you to be able to write and, and Zeke, what it takes for you to be able to, to make a movie. Um, anybody want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for putting up, first of all, um, it, it's very much a collaborative effort on this end. Um, I, you know, you're really only as strong as your team as cliched as that is, it, but it's the truth. And, um, so having people that are kind of on the same page as you too, like understanding what the budget is, understanding what how grassroots it is versus how, you know, maybe you have a little bit more luxury with the filming. Um, I think that makes or breaks, you know, your success. Uh, you know, um, for me, it's like I, with, with the sort of following that we have from the Once Upon a Time content, um, we've set it up in a way that, you know, every once in a while we'll have something that's a little bit more produced. And then we can also at the same time take pictures with our iPhone and throw that up on our Instagram or on our Twitter uh, or we do like live tweets during the episodes when they air. That's also content that doesn't cost much and doesn't take much of our time, but it's, it's still satisfying our creative itch and, and what our, our fans and, uh, you know, our, our collaborators, collaborators like to see. So for me, it's like, I love the idea of bloom where you're planted, you know, that you don't need money, you don't need time, you don't need anything to have like this perfect creative stuff because creativity is messy and um so you know I I always like <laughs> I just always as I've gotten older and uh have seen some sort of more like somebody mentioned spiritual principles kind of work in my life it's it's I really do try to operate from the idea that I can do it now you know somehow one little piece now and that um and it's okay if I don't have it the most polished right now I can aim to get there uh yeah. So that, that, that said, <laughs> I am also in a position where, um, I do want to achieve like, you know, a little bit of a growth rate with, uh, with some of my stuff have like a little bit more of like clout to, to some of the projects, get a name on a certain thing, get more funding. Um, so I am in that space of, of, uh, and really what it's about is just networking, but it's the same thing. It's again, it comes back to the team. It comes back to, um, who you are and who your team is and um, making sure that that matches and that aligns. And so uh, the sort of growth rate uh, that, well, the success that I've been having with, with some of my projects has been because of 
who I'm meeting and, um, and that coming from a really genuine place of, Oh, I'm just being me. And I happen to meet people who I really enjoy their company and, Oh, they happen to be working at Fox <laughs> or they're, you know, <laughs> they happen to own this film studio or, or they're, you know, whatever. Um, and so collaborating has become key as well. And I'll just leave with this uh, last little thing um, because I don't know how the rest of you operate, but I, I don't like to write for long periods of time unless I'm meeting a deadline. Then, then I can get into that zone. But I am not somebody that can sit and write for multiple hours. Um, I really like being around people. And so as a creator, a lot of times, and being in comedy and coming from acting, I will invite other actors over and we'll just play around with scenes and ideas. And I always record those sessions and um, sort of use that to help me get inspired um, with moving something forward. And that's another way to network that um, is sort of a nice surprise too. Like, oh, I didn't think of this person for this role. And, and then they come and they happen to know somebody else who can kind of move the project forward too. So um, I think it's just knowing who you are and how you like to operate and surrounding yourself with those people. Actually, Aaron, it's one of the reasons that uh, Renee was so um, jazzed about getting you and Ace and I together in the first place. As one oh, of the reasons that Renee. we respect you guys <laughs> so much is because you do, you work by that motto. You're not, you're not saying bloom where you are as like a general platitude. That is something that you guys have always done and and live by and and it has been a a token to your success and um people hear networking and you know there's that greasy stain on hollywood about what networking means yeah. people think it's really terrifying right but <laughs> but but what you touched on and and something that i think everybody needs to be reminded of is authenticity is the key if you're going to be a slimy asshole then yeah nobody's going to want to work with you but if, if you genuinely just want to do the work and you're, you're, uh, and you're a person who is uh, not there to meet the right people, but you just happen to you know, be, be engaging with the right people and you get along, uh, man, that, it's how the whole entertainment industry runs. All things yes. being equal, people prefer to work with their friends. All things not being equal, we still want to work with our friends. So it's, it, it just doesn't matter. It always comes down to that. Um, Jeff, what do you need to be able to tell your stories? Well, I wrote my first four novel manuscripts on this laptop that I'm talking to you on now on a crappy little Ikea desk in a room in my house. Um, I got up at 4 a.m. and wrote till 6 and then went to work. Um, for 18 months, that's all I did. And, and, and so I, I can't read my own handwriting. I'm terrible with a pen and paper. So I'll take pages and pages of notes and never read them. Um, so I need a computer. Um, at, now that I'm doing it full time, doing it on a laptop is terrible. So I have like an ergonomic keyboard and a bigger screen where I can have two you know, documents up next to each other. But at the end of the day, for me, it's you know, a laptop in a quiet room. Or if there's not a quiet room, you know, noise-reducing headphones uh, and, and music with no words. I can, I, music helps me tune in, but it has to be you know, something ambient or something electronic with no lyrics. Or even like Rat-a-Tat, you know, rock with no lyrics. Um, as far as tools, um, the only other thing is I, you know, I, I, the internet is, is amazing for research, um, but it's also even more powerful as a distraction. And so there's a, there's a program called Self-Control that's free where you can turn off, you can blacklist certain websites um, for any given amount of time. So I'll sit down, put my phone in another room and blacklist social media sites for two hours and just crank on it. Um, get up when I'm feeling restless, walk around, go to the restroom, get a drink of water, come back, sit down. Um, I need an unhealthy amount of caffeine to do what I do. Um, and I need long blocks of time without any interruptions. I interrupt myself constantly. So I can't like, it's hard to get anything done on weekends because kids and house. And so really during the week, once the kids are out of the house and until it's time to pick them up, I am shutting out the world, phone off in the other room, really trying to uh, crank, crank in. Excellent. And you know, there, you, you mentioned uh, music without words. I'm going to put in the description a, uh, a really neat sound generator that does storms, 
but it also does things like the Harry Potter common rooms and uh, oh yeah, the Doctor I use Who. that. Yeah, so it's it's a really neat thing. And for is it who, is it ambient mixer? Yes. Yeah, yes, I use I use mixer. the thunderstorm all the time. Yeah, I, and they, I, just, they just redid the interface so you can mute things, and it's really nice. Oh, it's awesome! Yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan. Whenever I do my taxes or accounting, I put that on, and it keeps the white noise in the back of my head so that I don't realize that I'm doing accounting. Um, Zeke, what do you need, man, to be able to tell your type of story? Spite. <laughs> <laughs> so honest. <laughs> just the spite, right? Just the just spite. spite. Just yeah. spite. Um, what do I need to tell stories? Uh, it really depends on what I'm doing. You know, uh, like I said, you know, it's filmmaking, uh, as Aaron said, is, is extraordinary collaborative, you know, um, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, so, so having the right people around you, um, especially if you want to achieve a certain level of quality. But I mean, really, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you, you need the right tool for the right thing, for the right, right, project, you know, the right tool for the right medium, um, you know, and the cool thing is that there's now a ton of tools. Uh, so I'm starting to experiment with uh, like live, just spot live as we're doing now, um, live storytelling, uh, what you can do with that. Um, really, it's just you just kind of need, I need um, just sort of, uh, it's, it's, no spite. We'll just get with spite. Um, <laughs> but well, no, you need like yeah. you need like the the right sort of like you know it's it's I I personally just kind of need like the right sort of motivation you know to tell a story. Uh, and usually that's I kind of have that that like Mister Toad uh, uh, attitude when it comes to things where like I'll I'll see like you know like Facebook Live and I'm like Toad where I'm like I'm Motaka. And I want to go experiment with that, you know, and see what I can do. You know, the same thing that excited me about, you know, with Fun Size was doing a bunch of short form storytelling and, and the idea of how much can you tell a story in a compressed space. So I like a good challenge, you know. Um, that's really what drives me uh, is to um, uh, see something and, and be like, oh, what can, I, what can I do in this space? What can I do, you know, with this medium? Um, uh, so I kind of, I, I, I tend not to, even though most of my stuff is filmmaking, I tend not to, to stick with a particular type of filmmaking, um, just because I like, I like new challenges and I like the idea of, of seeing what new thing I can do. You know? Zeke brought up a really good point. The, the idea of a, a compressed time frame. anytime you can put limits or boundaries, uh, on something, it, it, it helps you, you know, to have a vessel that you need to fill. Whether it's well, the first draft has to be eighty thousand words, or you got to write a thousand words today. You know, having some quantity to work with, for some reason, all you need is that one handle of limitations, and you can start to fill up that bucket. And, and sometimes it's just that the limitations piss you off, and you want to defy them. <laughs> Whatever it is, yeah. limitations like. are are seem to really help art in general. Even if it's just you have to paint it on this canvas, that's all you have. Well, and that's, yeah, that's, I mean, the, that's the, the old uh, Jaws story, too. Like, the, the shark didn't work. So we got a better movie because we couldn't see the shark. You know what I mean? It's, it's uh, your limitations can sometimes be your best friend and your best ally. Yeah, this, yeah, this actually, like, when I, when I write things the fastest, when things kind of come out, uh, is when I have, when you kind of, like, limit, you know, the, the infinite possibilities when you sit down at the page of, like, this could be anywhere. When you're like, okay, I have to write something, and this is what I have access to when I go into production with it. Um, that's, like, the most helpful because you know what to write to. Mm. Well, and uh, actually, speaking of that, Zeke, um, what is – is there something that you guys are working on now that uh, – that is affecting your process or, or you like, how are you telling the story that you're working on now? What are you working on now? Um, right now? I mean, that's yeah, working on a lot of things right now. Uh, yeah. it's like I said, I keep seeing all these motocars. Um, uh, like you and I were working on, on, yeah. on a feature. Uh, you, you told me about some resources that you have. 
up up in Oregon. And I was like, oh, wow, let's write to something for that. And let's make something. Um, and uh, the story ideas for that are coming together very fast and clear just because I know what I'm writing to. Um, and actually, I think, Zeke, I, I, I wasn't sure. I probably should have talked to you about it beforehand, but I think it's okay to talk about the generals as far as what's going on here. But, yeah. um, but what, uh, <laughs> what Zeke and I discovered was that we have an extraordinary amount of resources up here in Portland. And it, again, it's one of the Don't reasons we're being right here. Just we say it. No, I'm saying you and I have them. Not okay. the rest of the world. <laughs> no, you and I have them. We happen to have them. And in the, in the tradition Me of- Me, the guy uh, the plat with the platform of like, let's help filmmakers make films. I'm like, don't tell them about the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> in this particular case, it is That's actually it is. pretty, pretty yeah. insular as far as what, uh, who, who's got access to what. But, um, but because we have this opportunity and because I happen to live in what looks like a early 1980s Steven Spielberg movie, you know, the idea was, let's tell a story. What, what, do we, what do we have to tell a story with? And so I just sent him a bunch of images of what is around and what is available for us to be able to use in the neighborhoods and like local available filming areas, high schools, shop fronts, downtowns, things like that. And then Zeke was able to come up with, uh, with the seed of a story that is now growing into something that we'll actually be able to do, you know? And, and sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, of what you've got available and making it work. Um, yeah, and another thing that, that like I'm working on right now that's kind of a driving force is just you, you, you kind of want to, if you really legitimately have something to say, um, uh, right now I'm putting together a, a anthology through Fun Size 4 that uh, is horror shorts generated for kids. Um, mm. It's supposed to be, basically we're working with a child psych or a developmental uh, psychologist uh, who's like going over the material and stuff and, and uh, because we want the stories to be scary, but we also want uh, to create content that children can watch and will help them to learn and how to deal with fear in productive and healthy ways. Um, mm. And kind of the, uh, the um, genesis of that idea was, was started a couple of years ago when we kept on having the, um, it, was, it seemed like there was one mass shooting after another uh, and a lot of that kind of came from, you know, I, there's so many reasons for that, but I think one of the reasons why is because of the society, uh, the American society in particular, there's a lot of shame around fear and we've had the fear dial cranked up to 11 for well over a decade now, going on almost two decades of, you know, this group's going to kill you, this economic collapse is going to destroy you these people are going to hurt you, you know, these people are going to take your job. It's just nothing but anxiety and fear. And you now have a generation of people that have been living in that uh, environment and not, um, and, and, and given the only tool of dealing with fear, which is if something's scaring you, you should feel ashamed for feeling fear. Uh, and I think this was causing a lot of, was, I think this is one of the key factors is causing a lot of the, the outbursts of violence uh, and a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, problems that we're seeing today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so not only myself working on this, but I'm working on it with, with a group of filmmakers like we do with Fun Size and everybody is uh, extraordinarily passionate and, and really driven to do that because they're like, oh, I really want to put everybody, everybody that that comes to the projects is, is very excited to be working on it because they, they all want to contribute, you know, to, to elevating the conversation and elevating kind of our, uh, uh, elevating where we are currently as a culture. Excellent. Excellent. Aaron, you, you actually touched on in the beginning a little bit of, uh, of the number of irons that you've got in the fire right now. Are there any unique hurdles that you're being challenged with right now in your effort to tell a story? Like, is the business getting in the way of the actual storytelling? Um, yeah, well, you know, one of the interesting things that has come up, uh, which is a, a wonderful problem to have, is uh, <laughs> uh, like commerce is starting to come into play here. And um, I've been approached to, to do some projects 
uh, you know, for actually getting paid. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fantastic. It's the dream. Yes. Um, and the interesting thing that I'm struggling with is, um, is creatively if, if I really want to do them, you know? Um, so that, that's something that's new. Uh, cause I've usually just always sort of either been a part of other people's projects or have created my own that, that really I enjoy doing and not that I don't enjoy challenges. And, and like I said, it, it, this might just be a little bit of a limitation that actually sparks some really cool ideas. Um, but I very much love the, like, um, the genre space and blending that. And so when somebody's asking me to write like a, a straight something or other, it's, uh, uh it's hard. I, I'm not as like thirsty for it right now. And so that's something that I know takes a long, a big part of my time. So it's about, uh, you know, sort of deciding if that's the right thing or do I trust my gut and dedicate my time towards like another project that just feels more like a passion project that I want to do. Um, so yeah, that's a new challenge for me. Um, and then the other thing is just balance in general. Um, I think because, uh, you know, uh, wanting to start a family, all these, all these things are kind of up for me right now and, um, where we're going with game of Thrones, the musical, um, what we want to do with that, that's in, that might involve a location shift for me. Um, so, you know, the, yeah, just, there's a lot of sort of like unknown elements right now. And I just have to sort of sit in it for a while and you sort of test everything out and just trusting that I can, you know, I can handle all these, these sort of pots that are cooking right now. Like I, I think me, I, I want to get in there and I want to be like, oh no, let me just throw everything out and have only one. But that's really never who I've been. Um, I've always been that person that has many things. And um, I think now as society, like we accept that and that's, that's cool. And that's like a new thing that we're like, yeah, that totally makes sense. But as a kid growing up and in college and even working with coaches after college, the pressure was to just focus on one thing. And so that message is still in my head, like, oh, I need to be doing just one thing. But honestly, that's just, that's just not who I am. So having to really accept, like, I'm doing okay. I just have to take more time out to make sure that I'm getting to the doctors and I'm getting to the dentist <laughs> and I'm getting sleep. And as long as those basic needs are met and I have time for my, my friends and my family and my husband and all that, um, which is not perfect right now. But uh, I think attending to those needs and... It, it just trusting the process right now. I think that's really what's up for me. Excellent. Yeah, time yeah. management, that's going to be a whole new discussion that we're going to you have know? to have at a later time. <laughs> um, uh, she, she brings up an interesting uh, thing, Jeff, that I actually want to talk to you about. Their success has a whole new set of variables and demands that go along with it. You had... Uh, Symptoms of Being Human come out, which is a fantastic book. And uh, guys, there will be a link in the description down below. Awesome. Um, I really suggest that you read it. It it really touches on uh, issues that are prominent, especially right now. So check it out. It also is, anyway, I wrote a thing. It's on the whatever. You should check it out. Um, but that was a solid launch of a first novel. Um, are there pressures and requirements and expectations that now affect how you feel you can tell stories? Oh God, yes. <laughs> um, well, are there pressure? So yeah, I mean, I, I, I signed on to a two book contract um, and Symptoms was sold based on 100 pages. So they bought two books based on an incomplete one book. So that's a leap of faith on both parties, right? Um, it's a leap of faith on their part. Can you finish a book? Uh, and can you write another one that's, you know, that would appeal to the same readers? And then, you know, it's a leap of faith from my part. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm committing the next X years of my life uh, to a financial situation with you guys. So it's been very, the second book has been very challenging. Part of it is there's been a shift in the YA space. Um, and it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, my first book is about a character who's a member of a marginalized community of which I am not a member. Um, and my book was very well received um, by that community. Um, but it has become increasingly taboo 
for that to happen, um, for, for a writer to write outside their um, gender space, their, their cultural space. Um, and so th there is a lot of pressure um, to, <laughs> to write a book that's uh, issue charged, um, but that's also has the same authenticity as symptoms. So that's been a challenge um, and it's an ongoing challenge. Um, but you know, the, the, for me as an artist, part of what's difficult about the book cycle is that it's long. You know, if you're Stephen King, you can put out a book a year. That's still one event a year, essentially, with trickle-down events. And coming from a performing background, that's not enough for me. Um, so I've always got multiple book ideas in the hopper. Um, but one of the ways I've learned uh, I, that I've since, since I quit my day job 18 months ago and I've been writing full time, one of the things I've learned about me is I need more, not instant gratification, but I need to participate in creative cycles that are shorter. So that's why I've started this podcast called the hero's journey podcast with my good friend, Dan Zarzana, whom you are very acquainted with. Um, uh, and for a, people who, who have watched the live discussions before, Dan has been a member of many of those discussions. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he, he, yeah. Yeah, he's a book blogger at Book Thump. And um, so he and I are doing a podcast about storytelling that we're going to do once a month. So that gives us something to, you know, essentially write, shoot, edit, uh, release. Um, I am, I joined a, a, a cover band that's a fully choreographed costume, 80s themed cover band that is absolutely a blast. So a couple times a month, I get to go be rock singer guy. Um, and then I'm currently working on a new book that is way, way outside the scope of symptoms. And so it's very satisfying and fun. And there's sex and death and uh, computer hacking and all sorts of ridiculous stuff that I, that I just am really enjoying digging into. So for me, it's about feeding the creative beast, but our time is precious. So we have to create something that gives our potential audience touch points, right? So potential readers could listen to this podcast. Um, I hope no potential readers ever come to see uh, my band and judge me by that because it's <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> but you know, you want to you want to do things that align. You have to figure out what your brand is, which is just really your commercial identity, right? And and if you're an artist, the closer those two things align, the easier life becomes because you don't you know you can. For me, it's difficult to pretend. And so I, I like to have my commercial side of me be authentic. Um, but I'm also not a very, uh, I'm a very all over the place kind of person. So developing that is my current challenge. How do I turn that launch into the beginning of a career that seems coherent and that, you know, that has overlap from book to book? Um, and also that makes sense in a commercial trajectory. Because at the end of the day, if you want to make money telling stories, First, you have to sell them to some kind of representative, and then that representative has to sell them to producers or publishers or whoever it is. Um, even if you're going direct to publisher or you're producing it yourself, enrolling other people in the concept in a very small period of time and having them be interested in what happens next, that's a whole other kind of storytelling called marketing. And in the 21st century, <laughs> if you're an artist, you, you, you know, unless you're Kurt Cobain and you're a genius and, and you have two choices, you know, uh, uh, rock star or, or uh, janitor, uh, those of us who are in the sort of working arts community, you have to figure out how to tell the story of your story to people who might buy it. And that is always the thing that requires far more time and energy than you think it will when you jump in. Yeah, it's it's uh, something you learn when you start making movies is that uh, actually casting and shooting is the smallest part of anything that you're going to do. The most mm -hmm. glamorous part is the tiniest bit. Yeah, Everything you have to get all that planning. sand in this. You got to bring the sand and put it in the sandbox. Yeah, exactly. And then in the end, you got to cut it all together. Post ends up being the longest part of any kind of production because you got to cut it together, make it sound right, and do all that, all that, uh, that shenanigans. You, you waxed a little Christopher Walken there. Uh, just the a end. little. You got to put it all together. Put it all together. You got to do it. Box. It's tough. 
I'm not going to be in the. Now, see, you, like, you go a little uh, John Travolta with your walk in at the end. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, I really feel like it becomes a John Walken kind of situation. Oh, my God, it's so weird. Oh, my so God. Weird. My head. You should do John Walken reading YouTube comments in the park. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Ladies and gentlemen, my one man show. That's a strong concept. <laughs> doing the YouTube comments in Pioneer Square Park. December 2017. You I swear to God, whole, if this like, becomes Andy a real Kaufman, thing. Uh, John Walken, like, character <laughs> that you don't know what's real and what's not. Oh my God, <laughs> Sandy, I met her on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I took this uncomfortable hunk of metal in my ass. Um, it's so eerie anyway. how you do that. I know, right? It's just, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we have cleared an hour. And so, uh, Aaron, I know you actually have meetings to go to because you are a busy lady. Yes, um, yes, and, yes. And we all, we all have things that we need to get to. So what I'd like to do, again, these discussions are for people who are looking to take the step into actually being creative, telling their stories, doing the work that they want to do. Are there any, is there any advice that you can give them, short advice, that you can give them, like one piece that you would want them to walk away from today with? And Aaron, I'll start with you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no uh, pressure. Your yeah, first. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, and again, I don't mean to keep piggybacking off of everybody, but you guys are so great uh, um, <laughs> at, your, at your feedback. Um, I, think the, I think the idea of commercial identity, I really like that. Um, uh, I think getting to know who you are as a person is essential. Um, you can't operate from very long from anything else. So being authentic and merging that with a commercial space is the key to creative and um, financial success in this business. Excellent. Uh, very good. Thank you. Jeff, any last parting bits of wisdom that you'd want people to walk away from or walk away with? Um, reject preciousness. And what I mean by that is Learn to identify the things that you do that work by the way other people respond to them instead of the way you respond to them. Because if you enjoy producing, but you want to make a living at it, you have to learn how to produce things that other people will respond to. So I'm not saying don't follow your heart. I'm not saying don't write what you like. What I'm saying is when you get to that point where you're starting to have the conversation about a transaction, you really have to focus on the echo that your voice makes. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Zeke, any last minute bits of wisdom for the people? Um, yeah, a uh, couple actually. Um, one, uh, just at least uh, to speak to filmmaking, um, uh, like a lot of people, uh, it's kind of, going back to the thing is of, of not waiting for permission. Um, you also, when, when you go out and you network and you try to find other people to collaborate with, don't worry about the people that are on the rungs of the, of the ladder higher than you, you know, work with people that are on your level, work with people that are below your level. Um, you know, like we've had like one of the favorite shorts that we have up on fun side was written by a writer who was an intern at a place where the director was working at, you know? So, don't worry about the people above you worry about the people around you work with them um and then also like enjoy your life you know i made myself miserable by putting my life on hold to, to film here for a very long time and uh i got nothing done and it wasn't until i realized that uh, i need to actually be living my life and uh and and enjoying that and not worrying about maker being a specific thing um that i was able to actually like start actually being creative and it freed up my mind a lot because i was actually like uh, my mind was in a place that it could actually tell stories instead of focusing on wanting to tell stories um and so those are the two pieces of advice i have which is you know it's all kind of under the same umbrella of uh you know this be aware of what's around you you know yeah. just uh, be aware of what's around you and appreciate it. Curtis, I hate what I said and I want to take it back. 
<laughs> but I, I, I take no, I take back my advice. No, 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 no. I, no, I, I, no. Really, I really think it's important that what you said what you said, and I'll tell you why. Well, well, hold on, hold on. I, 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 I think what I said is valid, but I also know that it's it's not the message I want to send to the audience you described right before you asked the question because okay. I want to back up. So put that put that reject preciousness block up on this shelf for a second. On this shelf is find something where you enjoy the bullshit involved. And here's what I mean. <laughs> if this, if this is your yeah. circle Actually, of time, solid. okay, if yeah. this is your circle of time, this much of that circle is the writing or the shooting or the production or the fun part. The rest of it is, you know, for a writer is, you know, conversations with agents, going to writers' conferences, conversations, uh, you know, uh, pitching stories, all that other stuff, the auditioning. I quit acting because I hated auditioning. And I'm like, this is a terrible Same. profession for me. So <laughs> in, find something where you enjoy that 80% of the other stuff. And that's where you can have a career where you can not be miserable. If you're doing something where you only like painting, but you hate going to the art store and you hate talking to potential art buyers and you hate going to galleries and you hate looking at art shows, you, you're not going to have a good time. Make that a hobby. So find something where you can enjoy that, the bullshit part. That's my advice. Okay, that's solid. That's solid. And uh, I just want you to know, both of them will be in the highlights. So there you go. Yeah. Um, if, there's, if there's one thing that I think every creative artist type person, no matter what field, genre, medium you're going to work in, I think it's important that everybody have a solid support system. Now yes. that may come in the source of friends, that may come in the, in the form of collaborators, family. Um, it may be just a uh, internet bulletin board that you can safely go to. Maybe it's your Tumblr page where you get the kind of support that you need. I don't know what that is for you. I, but I think it's really important. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, but, but whatever, whatever that source of support is, I think it's really important for everybody to have that because no matter how well things go, there's always going to be that time when it, when it isn't so good and you're going to need somebody there to help keep you from, uh, from going too deep in the pit. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, Aaron, it's been a real pleasure. I, I hope I can uh, bring you in on these again. Uh, yeah, Jeff, thank you. Buddy, this is, this is the good stuff. And Zeke, uh, yeah, we're going to have to do more of these because clearly Skelly is, uh, is a star. And, uh, and I think we're going to have to see a lot more of him. So well, I do, I do want to say, like, um, I'd be open to writing something with you guys for Fun Size Horror. It seemed like Zeke started off the whole thing just being like kind of resentful toward me for not having done anything. <laughs> for, and I, at the end of the day, I just want, I just want talented and more famous people to like me. And so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's write something. I think Skelly, um, I like Skelly more than I like Zeke, but in a, <laughs> but in a very sort of selfish way. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, before this goes too far off the rails, um, we are going to have links to all of the people in today's panel down below inside the description. I'm going to be adding links to some of the tools that we talked about today, including the books, The War of Art and the Hollywood Survival Guide for Actors. Uh, these, are, these are books that we find valuable in the work that we do, and maybe you'll find value in them as well. Um, thank you again, guys, for coming. Thank you all for watching. It's been a real pleasure to watch that viewer count go up, up, up this entire time. And again, the That's highlights. That's all we care about. I know, right? The views are fantastic. <laughs> Love us! Um, uh, the highlights video for this will be uh, out on Tuesday. And, uh, and then next week, next week, we are going to have our permission to fail discussion next Sunday. So we're going to be talking about giving yourself permission to fail because if you don't, you might die of the stress that comes along with trying to do any kind of creative endeavor. One last time, I say goodbye to all of you out there in the YouTubes. Have a good one. We'll see you next week.